I thank our worship leader for ushering us into the presence of God. And I'm so delighted to be with you. And so I just want to take time to thank Pastor Tone for allowing me this opportunity, inviting me to share with you. Um, we have a great relationship. I, I just have so much admiration and respect for him. Um, not only as a colleague, but as a friend. And I always, always want to acknowledge my husband because there's a special call on a man's life to be the husband of a woman who preaches. And he uh, carries that way well. So I'm grateful. So today we are talking about um, unseeing. And um, you know what? I'm going. I came with two plans, so I'm going back to Plan A. And we're talking about Esther. We're going to mention Vashti as well, or Vashti, however you pronounce it. But we're mainly focusing on the Book of Esther, and we're talking about invisible women who displayed invincible faith in an incredible, incredible God. And so most people are familiar with the book of Esther, and this is why I came with the plan B. And plan B doesn't seem to be working either. So most people are familiar with the book of Esther. If you are a member of a church or um, just a Bible student, and it's one of two books that are named after women. I'll tell you, the book of Esther is exciting and it is dramatic. It's really the stuff that movies are made out of. And although God is never once mentioned in the story, we see his hand at work in the lives of every character. We usually hear the story of Esther and stories of women at women's ministry events, other special services that honor women. And so I'm really, really excited to talk about Esther and Vashti at a regular church service. And believe me, my brothers, you will not be left out because there is something in this story for everyone. The lessons in the story are universal and they are modeled by faithful women and a God-fearing man. You know, it's difficult to pull out just a portion of the text to read, so please indulge me while I share the story for those who don't know. Because even if you're familiar with the story, I encourage you to go home, to read it. It's short, it's exciting, and it's an easy, easy read. The story takes place in Persia, and the Jewish people have been exiled from Jerusalem, and they are living under the rule of a foreign king, Ahasuerus, and in some translations, Xerxes. The king and all of his top officials from all over the country have been partying for 180 days. Imagine that, a six-month party. And as his party begins to wind down, he hosts a party for seven days for all the people of the province, all the people of the country. The rich, the poor, the men, the women, the young, the old. And the Bible says that there was abundance of wine freely flowing. No one was forced to drink, but whoever desired were encouraged to eat, drink, and be merry. The king, of course, had his fill and was very drunk. He decided to call the queen Vashti to show herself before him and his top officials by coming into the palace with her royal crown and parade her beauty. Now, it's not clear whether his orders were for her to come to the palace in only her crown or 
fully dressed, wearing her crown. But the sole purpose was to satisfy the male gaze. And I want to suggest, and it's just a suggestion, that this was probably not the first time that she was called to display her beauty. And so I'm going to argue that this time, she was sick and tired of being exploited, sick and tired of being sick and tired, and the queen refused to go before the king. Needless to say, the king and his boys, they were happy, they were angry, and they were offended. In fact, the king was so angry that he asked the men what he should do. And they all decided that this can't get back to the other women. Because if this gets back to the other women and gets known around the country, then all of the women are going to disobey their husbands and disrespect them. So the best thing to do, they thought, was to make an example of her banish her from the kingdom. And so the king decides to do just that, and we never, ever hear from Vashti again. We don't know if she was killed, or if she just simply left the palace, but we never hear about her again in the entire Bible. And so although her voice is silenced, and we never hear from her again, Vashti's story is important. You see, without Vashti, there would be no Esther. Without Vashti, there would be no victory. See, Vashti is the woman that we love and we hate. Vashti is the woman that has moral courage. She's the woman that doesn't go along with the program. Troublesome, if you ask some people. She's the woman with the courage to say no. No, you will not disrespect me. No, my body is God's temple. No, I am God's property. It took amazing courage to stand up to the king. She knew she was risking everything. She lost her home, she lost her friends, she lost her marriage, her money, her position. But what she didn't lose, she didn't lose her integrity and her self-respect. Oh, that we would know her. Oh, that we would be her. I thank God for the Vashtis in the world. Those women who are bold and brassy and bodacious. They are truth-telling and risk-taking. Women who don't mind standing for something. And it is those women who remind us to be courageous. You see, Vashti, or Vashti, however you want to say her name, spoke truth to power. She spoke truth to power and she reminds us. Okay, so you know what? This is not working. <laughs> this is not working. So, we are going to do what we have to do best. It can be, but you know what? My, I think my computer would be better. This is fine. This is fine. We're going we're gonna to be all right. So, she, she spoke truth to power. She stood up to the king. She subverted the system. She turned the whole power structure of the kingdom upside down. She was subject to the king, but she flipped the script. She flipped the dynamic of the system, owned her personal power, and I believe she walked away like a boss. Because you see, power is not what other people give you. Power is not about money. It's not about position. Power is simply the ability to act. And Vashti acted with righteous indignation. And I believe that she honored God and her body. I like Vashti. I like her because women like Vashti are examples of courage that inspire and pave the way for the Esthers in the world. And so as a result, Ahasuerus, Ahasuerus's anger 
he was embarrassed, and so with the advice of his men, he decided that he would issue an order that across the entire kingdom, that all women must obey their husbands in every matter. And then he began to search for a new queen. And the king requested that the most beautiful virgin girls from every province come into his harem. The harem is a place where the king kept his concubines or his secondary wives. The harem is where all of the young women came. They went through beauty treatments for a year to prepare for one night, one single night with the king. Now I want you to know that the women really didn't have a choice in this. They were compelled by the king's decree. And in our modern culture, we might call that human trafficking, but that is a sermon for another day. But for one year, they received beauty treatments. They learned the ways of the kingdom. They learned how to please the king. And they would bathe in oils and perfumes. They were trained in the protocol. And then one by one, they were presented to the king. Each virgin would spend one night with the king. And from that one night, he would decide who he loved best. And here is where Esther enters the story. Esther was a Jewish girl of about 14 years old. She was living in Persia, exiled from Jerusalem. And in Persia, she belonged to a minority group. And many of us know what that feels like. Like all, these, all of the Jews, she lived in danger of oppression. She lived with persecution. And both of her parents had died. She was adopted by her cousin Mordecai. And brothers, if you are looking for a model of a godly man, then Mordecai is your dude. Stick a pin in that, because I'm going to revisit Mordecai. So Esther is young. She's displaced. Um, go ahead. She's young. She's displaced. And we don't know what happened between the time that her parents die and the time that Mordecai takes her in. Was she homeless? Did she move from place to place? How did she care for herself? We can only speculate. But if you know people like I know people, Esther's been through some stuff. Thank God for Mordecai who takes her in and gives her some stability. But what I really like about Esther's story is that Esther shows us that it doesn't matter where you start in life. God has a plan and a purpose for each one of us. Nothing happens by accident or no matter what it looks like, God is working it all together for our good. Anybody know Tiffany Haddish? You familiar with her? Well, you know what, I, I just adore her. And it's not so much because of her comedy, her comedy is great, but it's her story. Her story has the handprint of God all on it. And Tiffany Haddish reminds me of Esther. You see, when she was about eight years old, her mom had a car accident and left, was left with a traumatic brain injury that changed her entire personality and she wasn't able to care for her children. And so Tiffany stepped in and she tried to care for her siblings, but eventually she was taken into the foster care system. And so she went to, from house to house until she finally aged out of the system. And we can be certain that life was not easy. To top it off, the accident was caused by her father who decided he no longer wanted to be married. But like Esther, God had his hand on her life. So she kept working at her craft and, make, and thanks to God, she didn't end up the way she started. And we don't have to either. Some of us have had rough starts. And even if our parents were present, sometimes they were present but checked out. 
some were checked out with addiction, some were checked out because they had misplaced priorities, some were checked out because they had to decide whether they had to work to find you or spend time with you. There are many, many reasons that parents can check out. Thank you, dear. But if you happen to find yourself in this story, I just want to remind you that nothing happens by accident. And no matter what it looks like, God is working it all together for your good. God has a Vashti and a Mordecai waiting in the wings at the divinely appointed time, and they will appear. So back to the story. Mordecai was Esther's savior, not the Messiah with a capital S, but a savior with a little s. And I'm telling you, we still need saviors. Not only did he take her in when her parents died, but Mordecai heard of the king's request and willingly gave her into the custody of the palace, hoping that she would find favor with the king. He advised her not to reveal her Jewish heritage. And I know that's far-fetched from our understanding. We don't get how turning a woman into the king could be a good thing, but based on the history and the culture of that nation, what Mordecai knew was that she would be cared for for the rest of her life. Because he was a, court, a courtier, Mordecai knew that even if she didn't find favor with the king, as kingdom protocol went, she would be kept and cared for in the harem. He also knew, because he sat in the king's court, that he would be able to check on her every day. And so, brothers, Mordecai is the example of a godly man who was sensitive enough to see a need and meet it without any expectation. He thought of and acted in what was her best interest, not for the immediate need, but for her future. And he navigated the spaces that she could not navigate on her own. And sadly, in 2021, Sometimes we still need men to navigate certain spaces for us. We need that without expectation. We need those things done for us in godly love. Young single mother trying to, to get a car repaired. There are so many situations and spaces that men navigate easier than women, especially when you're young and inexperienced. And so caring for a woman and godly love for a woman means you will help her navigate that space and you won't expect anything from her in return. And so as we move in the story, Esther finds favor with the king and she becomes the new queen. And then there's this subplot. The subplot is with Mordecai and a man named Haman. King Ahasuerus named Haman to be his top official. Hamo, Haman is ego-driven, he's feeling himself, and he decided that everyone in the kingdom should bow down to him. Again, Mordecai was a courtier, and Haman had to pass him by every day. And you know what? Haman refused to bow. Like most ego-driven people, Haman felt disrespected. But Mordecai stood his ground. Brothers, he represents a godly man who will take a stand when no one else will. Haman let his anger turn into bitterness. His bitterness turned into hatred. And that he not only wanted to destroy Haman, but he wanted to destroy all the Jews. He went to the king and basically said, these people are different than us. They have different customs and it's not wise to tolerate them. Let me destroy them. And the king issued a decree, and it was so. I'm telling you, this is the stuff that movies are made of. And remember, Mordecai sat in the king's courtyard every day, and every day he checked on Esther. Early in the story, he had advised Esther not to reveal her identity as a Jew, but now it's critical. It's critical that she own her heritage. And the Bible says that when Mordecai learned about all that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on burlap and ashes, and went out into the city crying with a loud and bitter wail. 
And as the news of the king's decree reached all the provinces, there was a great mourning among the Jews. And so they fasted and wept and wailed, and many people lay in burlap and ashes. And Haman had orchestrated a genocide. If nothing changes, the Jews were going to face disaster. And so Esther hears the weeping and the wailing and she sends a message to Mordecai, find out what is going on. And Mordecai sends her a copy of the decree with a message that says she needed to go and beg the king for mercy. And the text says, then Esther sent a message to Mordecai she said all the king's officials and even the people in the provinces know that anyone who appears before the king in his inner court without being invited is doomed to die unless the king holds out his golden scepter. And the king has not called me for 30 days. In other words, Esther was saying, Mordecai, do you want me to risk my life? Mordecai responded, don't think for one moment that because you're in the palace, you're going to escape when all the Jews are killed. If you keep quiet at such a time as this, deliverance and relief for the Jews will arise from some other place, but you and your relatives will die. Who knows if perhaps you were made queen for such a time as this. And brothers like Mordecai, there are times when you need to remind a sister who she is, who God made her to be. You've got to remind her that she's not her own and speak life into a potentially dead situation. Esther had that light bulb moment, that Godward moment, that moment when the light of God begins to shine and you begin to see your own strength and you find your courage because you realize that it isn't really about you. It's really all about him and that with God, there's nothing that is impossible. And so she calls the Jews to fast with her and has a newfound determination. And she says, if I perish, I perish. We know how the story ends. The Jews are saved and Haman is hanged and Mordecai is honored by the king. But there are three points that I want you to take from this story. And the first one is that I want you to cultivate courage. Esther 4, 13 through 17 Mordecai sent this reply to Esther, don't think for a moment that because you're in the place you will escape when all other Jews are killed. If you keep quiet at a time like this, deliverance and relief for the Jews will arise from some other place. But you, you and your relatives, they will die. Who knows, perhaps you were made for such a time as this. Esther displayed incredible courage and ultimately she was willing to die for the sake of her people. Courage isn't something we're born with. Courage is cultivated. Courage is developed. And when Esther accepted her assignment, she immediately asked Mordecai to have the people fast and pray that she would do the same. And she understood what was before her was bigger than she was. What stood before her was a God-sized task. She knew that she needed the power and the presence of God, not only to find favor with the king, but to continue to stand and faith death if she didn't. And so we must know that when we choose to walk in the plans and the purposes of God, we're going to be called to challenging assignments. You see, God has a habit of dishing out assignments that we can never accomplish on our own because it causes us to seek him. 
And in seeking his face, that is where we gain power. That is where we gain courage, by his presence and by his spirit. But you see, courage is not just about facing our enemies. Courage is loving our enemies too. It takes courage to walk in your own truth. It takes courage to stand when the world hates you. It takes courage to tell the truth, not only to your enemies, but even to your friends. And when we seek God for strength and courage, we can be certain that we will never stand alone. Cultivate your courage through prayer and fasting. Because with God, there's nothing that is impossible. And so the second thing that I want you to know is that God created men and women to work together. Mordecai gave Hadith a copy of the decree. I'm reading from Esther 4, 8, and 9, issued in Susa that called for the death of all Jews. He asked Hadith to show it to Esther and explain the situation to her. And he also asked to direct her to go to the king and beg for mercy and plead for her people. So he returned to Esther with Mordecai's message. In our story today, we have Vashti, who on one hand chose to subvert the system, who has been objectified and only called to satisfy the male gaze. And in her resistance, her refusal to come before the king and his men, she bucked against the king's authority. And he clapped back, not only by controlling her, but by controlling every woman in the kingdom. And this was a relationship that was full of conflict, rebellion, domination, a relationship rooted not only in the king's authority, but it was grounded in patriarchy. And then we, on the other hand, we have Esther, who operates in a little bit different way. She partners with Mordecai. You see, Mordecai, she could do that because Mordecai was found to be loyal and supportive and had moved in ways that showed Esther that he had our best interests in mind. Esther knew she could trust him. And so the wisdom and insight of Mordecai and the guidance of God enabled Esther to maneuver through the system. And sometimes God will use collaborative efforts to overturn injustice. And so God saved the Jewish people because they worked together. And brothers, I have to tell you, when you earn the trust of a woman, earn being the key and operative word, she will ride or die with you. And sisters, I want you to know that sometimes the best way to change the system is to navigate and work in the system because at the root of everything, God created us to work together and to walk together. And my third and last point is that God has not forgotten you. And Esther 2 and 8 says, as a result of the king's decree, Esther, along with many other women, was brought to the king's harem and the fortress of Zuza. Esther started life as a poor, young female. She was an outcast. The odds were absolutely stacked against her. She was an unlikely candidate for queendom. She was an orphan. She was by no means queen material. But God had a plan and purpose for her life. And while we never see or hear God mentioned in the story, through all the twists and turns, we get a sense of God's supernatural presence, navigating every circumstance for her good and for his glory. You see, as believers, there's no such thing as accidents, no such thing as coincidence. God's timing is providential. God's timing is perfect. And every one of us has a place in the plans and the purposes of God. And it doesn't matter where you start. You could start in Patterson and end in Princeton. 
It doesn't matter how you start. You can start broken and be healed and made whole. It does not matter what it looks like. It doesn't matter how many times you think about your faults or your failures and how many times you've fallen. It just doesn't matter. There is not one part of our lives. I don't care how grimy and dark and gritty and ugly that can't be redeemed. Not one part of our lives that is untouched by the hands of God. And no matter what it looks like, I can promise you, God is there. Yeah, he's there. There's no situation. There is no circumstance. There is no human being that is not subject to him. He has the power and he is the sovereign ruler. And so the best thing that we can do is search for and surrender to his will. And I don't know about you, but the world is too uncertain for me to navigate alone. I gotta have God. I have to have him. I need Jesus on my side. And if you are a woman, the world is just that much more difficult to navigate alone. And so I'm calling you. I don't know who you are. I don't know. Maybe your heart is broken. Maybe you're struggling as a single parent. Maybe you're struggling as a wife and a mother. I don't know what your story may be. But I'm telling you that God has the solution for you. And I really, really, really would love to pray for you. And you don't have to be, you don't have to be broken. You don't have to be on your last leg or whatever you want to call it. Maybe you're just struggling with your own identity right now. Maybe you're struggling raising your children and trying to find and balance it all. We do so much and so much is expected of us. And so brothers, while I love you, I'm calling on women right now who are either just struggling to find the balance in their life struggling to please God and their husbands, struggling to please God and take care of their kids, maybe don't know God at all and looking for a way. If you are here, just come to the front. God is calling you. Look, this is not my script. This is not my script at all. I just feel God calling somebody or somebodies. You're struggling. You don't know what to do. God's saying, I got you. You're tired. You've been working and working and working, and you can't seem to get anywhere. God's saying, I got you. Bless you. Is there anybody else?
Amen. Amen. Isn't God awesome? Amen. Hallelujah. God, I just bless you right now. I magnify and praise your name because there is none like you. And I thank you for what you're doing in the lives of your people. Thank you for what you're doing in the lives of your daughters in this season. And so Pastor Tone is going to come before us and he's going to issue you an invitation to Christian discipleship. Because I'll tell you, there's no sweeter walk than to walk with Jesus. Doesn't matter who you are, the where you've been, what you've done, rich or poor. God has a plan and a purpose for your life. Pastor. I'll give the Lord a hand, praise for our very own sister, Simone Oliver, bringing a word to us today. I'm so glad that all y'all could come out. I know it's hot out here, but Jesus still in the building. Amen. <laughs> oh, he out here in the field, man. And uh, with that being said, man, I, I do want to, um, as Reverend Simone said, I, I want to be able to um, offer a word of Christian discipleship to somebody here today. You know, just as Esther put herself in a place of danger in order to be used by God to save her people. That's what Jesus did at the cross. Um, he put himself in the place of danger when he took on our sin and the punishment thereof so that we can be saved. And maybe somebody here, you, 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 you've never met somebody who's willing to put themselves in harm's way for you. Maybe you don't know what it is for somebody to, 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 to willingly, sacrificially give up themselves for you. Um, that, that, that's exactly what Jesus did on the cross some over 2,000 years ago, family. And so maybe there's one here. Um, today, who, who, who wants to have that type of moment. You want to have your Esther moment, if, if you will, with Jesus today, man. I, 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 I invite you um, to trust Jesus as Savior and Lord today, family. Um, is there one, is there anybody who's never trusted Jesus as Savior and Lord? And maybe the Lord, as Reverend Simone was preaching that word, um, was resonating in your heart and encouraging you. Um, 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 yeah, the Lord was resonating in your heart. That's you, man. Just raise your hand real quick if that's you. If that's you, the Lord is calling you to trust in the Lord. It's all right. That's all right. That's all right. But well, that being said, if there's no, if there's not one, I'm, I'm going to pray um, us out for the day. Again, I thank you so much uh, for coming out, even in this hot weather. Um, and let's just give the Lord a hand praise even before as we, as we get ready um, to leave. Um, Jason, did we do offering? I wasn't here. I was out, unfortunately, preaching somewhere else. So we did. Did we do offering? We didn't. So um, one thing we do here at Transformations at the end is um, we invite people to partner with us. We call people partners as we continue to forward the mission agenda of Jesus. And so right in the back, there'll be a basket with Miss Darlene with the Nike uh, umbrella. Shout out to uh, Miss Darlene. She in fashion with the Nike umbrella <laughs> in Jesus name. <laughs> All right, man, just stop by. See Miss Darlene. If you have a gift, the Lord puts anything on your heart to give to our ministry as we continue to forward the mission of Jesus. Let me pray. Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. Thank you so much for the powerful word that we had the time of worship that we were able to have. Um, we thank you that in, in spite of the hot elements, Lord God, you gave us a word um, to encourage us and you to remind us, dear God, that you're always working things out for our good, that you perform uh, a, a project, the palace miracles in our lives, Lord God. And we thank you for that. We thank you for the gift of, of, of Sister Simone um, introducing us to um, the another unseen, two unseen women in scripture in many ways who you used phenomenally and who displayed invincible faith in your incredible power, Lord God. And we just pray that you would help us to reflect their faith in you all these days. Lord God, I pray for the one who maybe uh, wants to trust you, but maybe was too shy to do it publicly. Would you do a work in their hearts? And I just pray um, that you um, would use this series as we close it out today um, to mobilize us to be people who display faith in you as you do incredible things in and through our life and witness for your glory. To God, we love you. We praise us in Jesus' name. Let the church of the living God say amen. 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 Go in peace. Go in mission. Go get you some ice cream in Jesus' name. <laughs>